In this video, I will briefly explain what eutetic alloys are and then discuss some of their specialized properties and uses. I will then demonstrate how to make a specific quaternary eutetic alloy known as Wood's metal. The word eutetic is of Greek roots. The prefix eu means easy and the remainder of the word means melting. This is a very practical name because eutetic alloys are quite easy to melt in most cases. Eutetics are commonly mapped onto phase diagrams. This specific diagram is for a binary eutetic alloy or an alloy consisting of two different metals. On the vertical axis is temperature and on the horizontal is the concentration of one metal in another. You can see that there are numerous regions inside the graph. Each of these sections designates a specific phase or a structure that will form in the alloy at a given temperature and concentration of each metal. Above the outlined sections, the alloy is above its melting point and is liquid, and as the temperature decreases and energy is removed, the alloy shifts into one of the outlined regions and various solidus phases begin to form. Now, if you notice the three yellow dots on the graph, these are the melting points of the pure A component, the pure B component, and the melting point of a eutetic alloy. What is interesting about eutetics is that at the yellow point in the middle of the graph, the freezing temperature of the alloy is less than the melting points of both metals that make up the alloy. The melting points of the base metals are denoted by the yellow dots on either extreme of the x-axis. Individually, the metals melt at a much higher temperature than the melting point of the alloy. Not all alloy systems form eutetics, and to be a true eutetic, all components of the alloy must melt at the same temperature once combined. Eutetic alloys are commonly used to replace dangerous lead-based solders that make up the plumbing of our homes and contacts in our electronics. In the plumbing industry, a eutetic alloy of tin, silver, and copper makes a particularly good replacement for lead because of the alloy's similar characteristics of good wettability and low melting temperature. Eutetic alloys also find their place in the fire protection industry. A heat-sensitive alloy can be used in sprinkler heads as a plug that holds back the flow of water of the sprinkler system. The water in the sprinkler system will be released once this pin is heated and melted from hot gases that result from a fire. Now that you know a little bit about eutetic alloys, I can show you the alloy that I made. Wood's metal, which is also known as Lipowitz's alloy, is composed of 50% bismuth, 26.7% lead, 13.3% tin, and 10% cadmium by weight. Here you can see that I weighed each of these metals out in their respective proportions. In the trays, I have enough metal to make a 200 gram sample of the alloy. After everything was prepared, all of the metals were transferred to my graphite crucible and heated until they melted together. The metals were subsequently sloshed around to ensure good mixing and then poured into a preheated graphite ingot mold. You should notice that throughout the experiment, I'm wearing gloves during any handling of the metals and that I chose to melt them together on a very windy day. These precautions were used to limit my exposure to the lead and cadmium, which are both quite toxic metals. Even touching them with bare hands is enough to contaminate yourself, not to mention breathing in their fumes. Both of these metals come with a host of adverse health effects, and because of this, I would recommend not repeating anything in this experiment. I was certain of my success in making this eutetic because once I cast the alloy into the ingot mold, it took more than 15 minutes to solidify enough to be removed. Wood's metal has an extremely low melting temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, and while I wasn't measuring the temperature during solidification, the outside of the ingot mold felt like a warm cup of water. You can see that even though I waited a fair amount of time to pull the metal from the mold, it was still not completely solid and split in two during removal. Overall, the alloy was quite lustrous and surprisingly brittle. The metal was so brittle that in this semi-molten state, it could be crumbled into pieces in my hand and agglomerated back together into a solid mass. The large amount of bismuth in the alloy is probably responsible for its brittleness. I make this assumption because pure bismuth metal itself is very hard and brittle. When it is struck, it shatters quite easily. It is also plausible that the brittleness could stem from the relatively fast rate of solidification of the metal, 
A fast shift from a molten to a solid state could cause brittle crystal phases to form in the alloy. Next I put the metal into a beaker and you can see that the crumbled metal solidified very well together and it remains in a solid piece now. I then filled the beaker with water and put it on my hot plate to examine its melting temperature. Every half hour or so I increased the temperature by small increments and I also added a thermocouple to the water to get an accurate reading on the temperature. The metal began melting between 158 and 159 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very close to the melting point of a commercial sample of Wood's alloy, and I was very happy with these closely correlating values. You can see that the melted portion of the metal looks very similar to mercury when the beaker is shaken around. It's interesting to observe low temperature melting metals, and I found this time lapse particularly entertaining. It's bizarre to see a metal that can melt in water that isn't even boiling, and this phenomenon is why I undertook the project. After leaving the metal in the water for a few minutes, I began to notice a discoloration on its surface. This is primarily the oxides of the alloyed metals that ended up floating to the top, but it could also be contaminants that were trapped inside the metal. It was very easy to scrape the surface and expose the clean metal with a glass stir rod, but once I removed the surface contaminants, it darkened fairly quickly. This leads me to believe that the metal was being oxidized by the water. I would expect that cadmium and tin are the primary metals being oxidized because of their position on the electromotive series. I continued to clean the metal by scraping its surface, and once the water had cooled enough, the metal retained its shiny luster. As it began to solidify, I noticed that portions of the liquid metal were trapped between a solid upper layer and the glass. This looked quite peculiar and interestingly, some of the crystals were exposed when the metal was moved away. They did not appear to have an easily identifiable structure, but it was definitely crystalline. The metal remained liquid for a long time, and once it was solid, it was quite difficult to remove from the beaker. However, I eventually managed to get it out. One small piece of the metal solidified into a long drip-like structure, and I decided to test its rigidity. I was surprised to see that it held up much better than the broken ingot and was actually quite difficult to snap for its size. There were some crystals on the inside of the drip, but they were too fine to examine their structure. I next wanted to test the castability of the alloy, so I remelted the puck in a clean beaker and set about making a mold. I used a small slip of paper and tape to make a cone and then situated it inside a beaker with some sand for support. The metal poured very well into the mold and it did not splash or deform the paper. I was actually very surprised that the heavy liquid metal didn't spill out of the loosely taped seams. I chose to make this shape because I planned to use this casting as a conductive base to electroform a copper cone. While doing this project, I also researched the density of Wood's metal and found that on average it is 6 9.6 to 9.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So it could be used for counterweights or a variety of other applications that require dense materials like radiation shielding. It was also interesting to see that this alloy was very good at wetting glass and it stuck very strongly to the beaker while it was molten. This is a property that gallium also has. Once the wood's metal solidified, I was easily able to remove it from the glass in large flakes and reuse them. I was surprised at how ductile the flakes were compared to the drip-like piece and the initial ingot. These both broke very easily, but the flakes I was able to fold many times before they actually broke. After the casting cooled, I examined it and I was pretty impressed with my results considering that I made the mold from a piece of notebook paper. For the most part, it was very smooth and had relatively few defects. There were some small granulated areas near the upper surface of the metal, but these blemishes could easily be buffed away. I would say that this metal is very castable and really could have a ton more uses if it were not so toxic.
Lastly, I tested the circularness of the cone, and I found that my paper cone making skills were actually very impressive. Thanks for watching. Please like the video, comment, and subscribe.